Hey everyone, and welcome to chapter 15 on the diversity of animals. This is the last chapter where we are exploring the range of biological organisms. We've previously talked about the diversity of plants as well as the diversity of microbes and fungi. And now we're going to finish that all off by discussing animals. So we'll start by discussing some general characteristics of animals. Animals are composed of eukaryotic cells, which means that they have the larger, more complex type of cell that contains a nucleus and other organelles. All animals are heterotrophs, which means that they are consumers. They have to eat other organisms in order to obtain their nutrition. They cannot produce it themselves through photosynthesis like plants can. Animals are also multicellular, meaning that their bodies are composed of more than one cell. And something that is unique about animals is that they possess what are called body systems, which are systems of structures or organs that work together to perform a specific purpose for that organism, such as the nervous system, the muscular system, the reproductive system, the skeletal system. All of these things are considered body systems. We're going to walk through animals, sort of like how we walk through plants, where we're going to discuss the different groups of organisms, starting with the most evolutionarily primitive group and moving up to higher levels of sophistication. These different groups are referred to as phyla. The singular form of this word is phylum, but multiple is phyla. And there are nine different animal phyla, or rather major animal phyla, into which the vast majority of animals can be divided. So we're going to start with the most primitive group, and that group is the sponges. Sponges are so primitive that you may not even recognize them as being an animal when you see them. Sponges are the earliest branch of the evolutionary tree of animals, and out of all animals, this group is least closely related to humans, as you can see from the image on the slide. One thing that sets sponges apart from other types of animals is that they are asymmetrical and irregularly shaped. All other groups of animals have some sort of symmetry to their bodies, but sponges do not. They do possess specialized cells, but they lack proper body systems. And so they are sort of on the evolutionary path to body systems and that level of complexity, but they have not reached it. They are also sessile, which is the technical term for non-moving. Sponges are anchored in a one uh, single place and they cannot move, which also sets them apart from other animals. And the way that they obtain nutrients, because they do have to eat like other animals, is through a process called filter feeding. Filter feeding involves the sponges taking in water at their base and pumping it up through the interior body cavity of the sponge. And as that water is pumped upward, the sponge absorbs nutrients that are dissolved in the water. And in this video right here, you can see the sponges engaging in this pumping action as this diver sprays a little bit of colored dye at the base of the sponge. And you can see how it comes out the top of the body cavity. Anything that's dissolved in the water gets absorbed by the sponge and they use that as their nutritional material. The next phylum of animals on our list is the nadarians. Nadarians, um, and, and the way that this term is pronounced is with a silent C. You don't say nadarians, you say nidarians. Uh, so nidarians are your jellyfish. Uh, they are found uh, almost exclusively in the ocean. Every member of this group is an ocean-dwelling creature. Examples of organisms that you find in this group include uh, sea anemones, hydras, corals, as well as jellyfish. The nadarians are a little bit more sophisticated than the sponges because they have specialized cells that are actually organized into proper tissues like muscular tissue and nervous system tissue. And nadarians do not have a full and complete digestive system but they do have something called a central gastrovascular cavity. 
which is a chamber into which their, their nutritional material enters, as well as through which their waste exits. So it's kind of like their mouth and their anus all wrapped up into one. The food goes in that same hole and it comes out that same hole. Next, we have three different types of worms. We have flatworms, nematodes, and annelids. And we are going to discuss these three phyla of worms together so that we can get some comparison between them. Something that all three phyla of worms have in common is that they have bilateral symmetry, meaning that they are symmetrical down their center line. Um, their left half is identical to their right half, and they also have a long, thin body shape. The first group of worms, the flatworms, are found mostly in aquatic or damp habitats. They have flat, ribbon-like bodies that can range in length from very small, uh, one millimeter, up to dozens of feet. So tapeworms are an example of a flatworm that fits in this category, and if you've ever seen videos of tapeworms being extracted from the human gastrointestinal tract, this is the type of worm that we're talking about here. Flatworms do not have a complete digestive tract. Instead, they are somewhat like the Nadarians in that they have a gastrovascular cavity, but they don't have a full digestive tract. This is something they do not have in common with the annelids. Annelids are another type of worm, and they, like flatworms, live in mostly aquatic or damp habitats, but their bodies are recognizable because they are segmented, and this allows them to execute more complex movements where they can bend in multiple different directions in different parts of their body. The typical earthworm, which you see in this image right here, is a great example of an annelid, and you can clearly see the segmentation along the body of the earthworm that is characteristic of annelids. And annelids also have a complete digestive tract, which means that they have a mouth at one end, an anus at the other end, and everything in between that allows them to digest and break down their food particles, whereas flatworms do not have that. And then lastly, we have the roundworms, which are also known as nematodes. The roundworms or nematodes live in nearly every ecosystem. They are ubiquitous across the face of the earth. They can be found in deserts, in jungles, in cold places, in hot places. They can be found living inside your body, on the surface of your body. Um, roundworms are so common that it is estimated that if you were to count up every single animal on earth and quantify them, Four out of five of all of the animals on Earth would be roundworms, which is crazy in number. Roundworms are known for having cylindrical bodies that taper off to a point at both ends. You can kind of see a little bit of that tapering going on in the roundworms in this image. And they, like annelids, have a complete digestive tract, so they have a mouth at one end, anus at the other end, and everything in between. In this first checkpoint, what I'd like you to do is compare and contrast for me those three different groups of worms, the round worms, or in other words, nematodes, flatworms, and annelids. And if you have trouble making this three-way Venn diagram um, on your word processing program, then you can go ahead and just type your answers and tell me what is similar between the different groups and what is different between the different groups. The next group or phylum of animals is the arthropods. The arthropods are by far the most numerous group of all the animal phyla. There are over a million different species of arthropods on the planet that have been identified so far. Arthropods are known for having segmented bodies and a hard exoskeleton, as well as multiple jointed appendages. Most arthropods also have a highly complex nervous system, which allows them to exhibit complex behaviors. Arthropods are so numerous that they are actually divided into a few different subgroups. The first of these groups is the arachnids, 
which also includes horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are actually different in their evolutionary ancestry from other crabs and are more, more closely related to arachnids or spiders. Arachnids have special feeding appendages, such as venomous fangs, and most members of this group are land-dwelling carnivores, which feed upon other arthropods for their nutrition. Arachnids also possess eight legs, which is an easy way to identify them. There are also centipedes and millipedes. These guys have very clearly segmented bodies. They also live on land and they have tons of legs. They have one or two pairs of legs per body segment. Then there are the crustaceans. This is where other types of crabs are found in this group. Um, they live in aquatic habitats, except for pill bugs, also sometimes known as roly polies or potato bugs. The pill bugs are the only land-dwelling crustacean, which are closely related to um, crabs, but they don't live uh, in the ocean. And the crustaceans is the group of arthropods that supplies us with many of our um, food sources that come from the ocean, such as lobster and shrimp, as well as soft-shell crab. And then there are insects. Out of all the arthropod groups, insects are the most numerous. They have recognizable body segments, such as a head and a thorax, and they also have legs, antennae, and wings. So in this checkpoint here, I'd like you to tell me which type of arthropod out of the four subgroups of arthropods is this one right here. This brings us now to the mollusks. Mollusks are characterized by a soft body that often, but not always, is protected by a hard shell. Most mollusks live in the ocean, although there are exceptions to this, and examples of organisms that belong to this group are snails, slugs, oysters, clams, but also octopuses and squids. Across mollusks, although, oh, although their bodies differ quite a bit, they are known to have three main body parts. One of them is called their muscular foot or feet. A mollusk may have a single muscular mass, which is called its foot, or it can have multiple muscular masses, which may come in the form of tentacles. And the foot is used for movement. Then there is the visceral mass, and the visceral mass is the main portion of the body that contains the organs of the mollusk. And then lastly, there is the mantle, which is a layer of tissue that covers the visceral mass and in some mollusks is responsible for generating the material that makes up the shell of the mollusk, although not all mollusks have a shell. Just like arthropods have different subgroups, mollusks too have three different subgroups. The gastropods are a type of mollusk that lives in aquatic habitats and that is sedentary and does not move. And that's mostly because they are found inside of a protective shell that has a hinge. So examples of mollusks that belong to this group would be things like uh, mussels or clams. Then there are the bivalves. Bivalves are the most numerous group of mollusks. And although most of them live in aquatic habitats, some of them do live exclusively on land, such as this banana slug that you see in the image. And then lastly, there are the cephalopods, which uh, is the group that includes squids and octopuses. These guys live in marine habitats, so exclusively in the ocean. And unlike the other groups of mollusks, the cephalopods have complex brains and behaviors and many of them also lack a shell, such as squids and octopuses. It may not seem like the cephalopods are closely related to the gastropods or the bivalves, but DNA evidence does indicate that cephalopods belong in this group that we call mollusks. And now we arrive at the second to last group that is called the echinoderms. 
Echinoderms live in the ocean, and the name echinoderm is actually Greek in origin and literally translates to spiny skin. The root word derm refers to the skin. You may um, know that dermatology is the study of the skin, um, and so derm means skin, echino means spiny, echinoderm means spiny skin, and that is indicative of how they have this hard and bumpy exoskeleton. They also exhibit five-fold symmetry, which means that they have five different planes to their body that are identical to each other. And so the perfect example of an echinoderm that we are all familiar with is something like a starfish, where you can clearly see its exoskeleton as well as its five-fold symmetry. Echinoderms do move. They are not sessile. They can move, but they move very slowly. And examples of members of this group include the sea stars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and sand dollars, believe it or not. And then the last group of the nine phyla is the chordates. Chordates are also a very diverse group, and they are the most sophisticated of the nine animal phyla. Chordates share four features, uh, at the very least, as embryos. And these features may or may not disappear by the time the organism is mature and as an adult. Uh, but at the very least, these four features unite all chordates when they are embryos. All chordates possess a nerve cord along the back. And in humans, this nerve cord develops into our spine. They also have something called the notochord along the back and that develops into part of our vertebrae. They also have a tail that extends backwards, and then they have pharyngeal slits that often develop into either gills or eustachian tubes. The chordates can be divided into two different groups, the vertebrate chordates and the invertebrate chordates. And the thing that separates them is that the vertebrate chordates develop a backbone and a skull, and the invertebrate chordates do not. So out of those four characteristics that all chordates exhibit as embryos, which ones do humans retain as adults? Now, the vertebrate chordates is the group that we are probably most familiar with when we think about animals. This includes uh, fishes, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. So what we are going to do is uh, focus on the chordates that are the vertebrate chordates, which are represented here. And we're going to take a closer look at some of these groups, starting with fishes. There are four different types of vertebrate fishes within this larger chordate phylum. Jawless fishes are one of them, and this includes fish that are, um, some examples of them are hagfish and lampreys. These fish have a skull, and as an embryo, they have a backbone, but they don't develop a jaw. They do have teeth, several rows of teeth actually, but they are not able to use those teeth to masticate on the food that they eat. Then there are cartilaginous fishes. Cartilaginous fishes are named for the fact that they have a flexible skeleton that is made of a tissue called cartilage. And cartilage is the material that makes up the interior of, for example, your ears and your nose. So it is a flexible, not fully bony material. Most members of this group are fast and agile carnivores, such as sharks. Bony fishes are the most numerous species of all vertebrates. Their skeleton sets them apart from cartilaginous fishes because it has been hardened by its calcium content, so these fish possess true bones. And then there are lobe-finned fishes. Lobe-finned fishes are uh, a little bit different from bony fishes because they, in addition to possessing a bony skeleton, have muscular front fins that have internal bones which are very similar to amphibian limb bones. 
So they almost are like fish that have arms in the front. And if you're curious to see how this works, if you look up um, videos of a fish called the mud skipper, you can actually see how these fish are able to kind of crawl along and lift themselves up out of the water using their muscular bony front arms. The next group of vertebrates is the amphibians. Amphibians are the first group of vertebrates that are considered tetrapods. And tetrapods are called tetrapods because they have four limbs and or feet. Tetra means four and pod means feet. So tetrapod means four feet. Amphibians reproduce in water. That's where they lay their eggs. But as adults, they can be terrestrial, meaning they can go on land. So they have this duality about them where they are both aquatic during their development as well as land dwelling as adults. Amphibians are known for having moist skin, proper lungs, which sets them apart from fish, as well as strong muscles and bones that allow them to exist on land. Examples of members of this group we call amphibians include frogs, toads, and salamanders. Next up are the reptiles. Reptiles are also tetrapods, meaning that they have four limbs and or feet. Reptiles are different from amphibians, however, because they develop inside of what's called an amniotic egg. And an amniotic egg is one that does not require a watery environment. This allows reptiles to reproduce on land instead of having to lay their eggs in the water. Examples of organisms that belong to the group reptiles include turtles, crocodiles, lizards, and snakes. And believe it or not, birds are usually also thrown into this category of reptiles because they evolved from a common ancestor. In this checkpoint, I'd like you to tell me one difference and one similarity between reptiles and amphibians. This brings us to our final and perhaps most beloved group of vertebrates, and that is the mammals. It is thought that the extinction of the dinosaurs is what allowed mammals to rapidly diversify, because once the Earth was largely free of dinosaurs, um, smaller mammals, which had been sort of kept in check by a flourishing dinosaur population, were able to then enter new opportunities and expand their range and diversity and evolve into new areas that they had not been able to before. Mammals are united by the characteristic that they have mammary glands, and that is the namesake of the category mammals. Mammary glands produce milk for newborn versions of these organisms. All mammals also have hair, and sometimes that hair is only present when they are embryos, um, although most mammals do have hair as adults. The hair is responsible for providing insulation for the body and maintaining its core temperature. There are actually three different subgroups of mammals, the first of which is called the monotremes. Monotremes lay eggs, which kind of sounds strange because we are used to mammals giving live birth, but uh, there are mammals out there that actually lay eggs. This includes species like the duck-billed platypus and the echidna. They do, however, also nurse their young after they hatch from their eggs. So they are both egg layers and nursers of their young. Marsupials are another type of mammal, which do give live birth to their young, but their young then have to complete their development by living inside of a pouch for what can be a long period of time. And then last but not least, there are the eutherians, Eutherians have a placenta in which young develop for long periods of time and uh, are born in most species, not humans, but in most species, sort of ready to go and ready to learn and ready to stand and complete all of the tasks that they need to do as an organism on land. And that completes our discussion of the animals and the diversity of animals chapter. So I will see you guys in the next chapter.